If you've ever tried to film a sunset on your phone before, then you've probably run into this problem. If I tap on the highlights, then the foreground just dips into silhouette. But now if I tap on the foreground, then the sky just becomes completely blown out. And no matter where I set my exposure, I'm always going to be losing some detail in either the highlights or the shadows or both. But now watch what happens if I point a professional camera at the same scene. Well, that's a lot better. It's still not perfect, but I'm able to retain a lot more information in both the highlights and the shadows of the image. But what's the difference between these two? Why is one camera able to retain more information than the other? And why should we lose detail in the first place? Well, the answer is dynamic range. So what is dynamic range? Well, the dynamic range of a camera system is a measurement of the amount of contrast that the camera can accurately capture at once. We can determine the dynamic range of a scene by measuring the difference between the brightest and darkest areas of the image. If the dynamic range of the scene is greater than the dynamic range of the camera, then some information will be lost in either the highlights or the shadows or both. Parts of the image which lie outside the camera's dynamic range will not contain any detail, and instead will usually default to either pure black or pure white. It's called dynamic range because we can adjust our exposure to bring different parts of the image into or out of the usable range. If I want to capture more detail in the highlights, then I have to lose an equivalent amount in the shadows, and vice versa. So the only way to capture both the highlights and the shadows at once is to use a camera with a better dynamic range, like I showed earlier. The lower your camera's dynamic range, the more often these clipped highlights and shadows will show up, especially in outdoor scenes with a lot of contrast between light and shadow. This is a problem because our eyes generally have a much greater dynamic range than our cameras, so images with too much clipping tend to look unnatural and unprofessional. Historically, poor dynamic range has been associated with cheaper cameras and lower production values, and this trend continues into the modern day. Film cameras tended to have a much greater dynamic range than TV cameras, and similarly, modern cinema cameras have much better dynamic range than consumer-grade cameras like you'll find in smartphones. But what actually causes the dynamic range of two cameras to be different? In fact, why should there even be a limit in the first place? Well, let's start by taking a look at one of the greatest factors that influences dynamic range, the camera's sensor. Although we refer to modern cameras as digital, the sensor itself is actually an analog device and is subject to the same constraints as any other electronic circuit. Each photosite on the sensor outputs an amount of voltage proportional to the amount of light which hit the photosensitive material during the exposure. However, this only works to a point. Every sensor has what's called a full well capacity, which describes the maximum amount of charge the photosensitive material can retain at a time. Once the well capacity is reached, the output voltage won't change no matter how much light hits the photosite. Since the output doesn't change, that part of the image is effectively clipped and can no longer retain any information. So that explains why our highlights become blown out when the image is too bright, but that doesn't explain why we sometimes lose information in the shadows as well. After all, if the well capacity was all we had to worry about, then we could just lower the exposure until we never expose any of the pixels. But unfortunately, the shadows have a limiting factor of their own. Theoretically, there's no minimum amount of light the sensor can respond to, but in practice, we have to deal with noise. Like all electronic devices, a camera's photosite inevitably includes some amount of random noise in its output. This is caused by a variety of factors, but no matter what you do, some amount of noise is unavoidable. Usually, the signal off of the sensor is much stronger than any random fluctuations, so it's easy to determine what the value was supposed to be. However, as the amount of light decreases, the signal gets weaker and weaker, but the noise does not. As a result, the noise becomes a greater and greater proportion of the signal until it's next to impossible to determine what the real value was supposed to be. This point is called the noise floor, at or below which it's impossible to retain any meaningful information. Together, the well capacity and the noise floor define the dynamic range of our camera. 
Any luminance value which falls in between these two points will be recorded accurately, and anything that falls outside this range will not. So why do different cameras have different amounts of dynamic range? Well, usually it comes down to the design of the sensor. There are a variety of factors which can influence where the well capacity and noise floor lie, but broadly speaking, larger sensors with larger pixels tend to have better dynamic range than smaller ones. Larger pixels have more surface area, which both increases the well capacity and also helps eliminate a common source of image noise. Since light exists in discrete packets of energy, we can expect the number of photons hitting each pixel to randomly fluctuate as light bounces around the scene. The larger our pixel's surface area, the more photons it collects, and the more this random fluctuation is smoothed out. Now that's not to say that there's a direct correlation between a pixel size and dynamic range, since other factors like the design of the sensor and the quality of the components can impact it as well. However, in general, the larger and more expensive sensors you'll find in professional cameras tend to have better dynamic range than the small and cheap ones found in smartphones or action cameras. However, actually measuring the dynamic range of a camera presents a bit of an interesting problem. Dynamic range is measured in stops, where one stop represents a doubling or halving of the amount of light. Since our eyes perceive luminance in a logarithmic fashion, increasing or decreasing the brightness by one stop looks like a linear step up or down in brightness. So given this, you might think that measuring the dynamic range of a camera is easy. Just measure the well capacity and the noise floor and then compare them, right? Well, unfortunately, it isn't that simple. While the well capacity acts as a hard cutoff, the noise floor is much more fuzzy. Detail doesn't just suddenly disappear. Instead, as the light level decreases, the image gradually becomes noisier and noisier until there's nothing left. So where do we draw the line between usable information and unusable noise? To illustrate this, let's take a look at one of the most common methods of measuring dynamic range. On this chart, each bar is one stop dimmer than the one previous. The bar on the far left is positioned right up against the sensor's well capacity, and then we simply count how many stops are visible before the image dissolves into noise. In this example, about 15 stops are visible. However, the last few stops are incredibly noisy, so you probably wouldn't want to use them as part of your final image. This is what people mean when they talk about the difference between dynamic range and usable dynamic range. But where you draw the line between usable and unusable is a subjective thing. So depending on who you ask, you might get different answers regarding the dynamic range of a particular camera. This is why you can't really compare the dynamic range of two cameras just by looking at a spec sheet. Different manufacturers will likely measure the dynamic range of their cameras in different ways, each trying to give their product the best possible score. For example, let's take a look at two popular cinema cameras, the Red Monstro and the Arri Alexa LF. Looking at their spec sheets, Red claims 17 stops of dynamic range, while Arri only claims 14.5. Given this, you might expect that the Red has better dynamic range, but if we actually compare the two side by side, you'll see that this isn't the case at all. In reality, the dynamic range of these two cameras is incredibly similar, and the Airy may even be a tiny bit better. But neither company was lying about their camera's capabilities. The RED can in fact see 17 stops above the noise floor, it's just that the last few are incredibly noisy. In contrast, Airy's estimate is much more conservative and only considers the first 14 stops clean enough to be usable. For this reason, the only way to accurately compare the dynamic range of two cameras is to test both of them with the exact same testing methodology and the same noise threshold. Websites like CineD will test various camera sensors using the same methodology, allowing users to compare results apples to apples. But all of this only pertains to the capabilities of the camera's sensor, and there's actually another factor which affects the dynamic range of our final image as well the gamma curve. Every non-raw image has a limited range from 0% to 100% to store luminance values. If we use a standard gamma, this means that the brightest area of an image can only be up to 100 times brighter than the darkest area. 
That might sound like a lot, but that's only six and a half stops, which is actually pretty awful by modern standards. Even if our camera is capable of seeing further into the highlights and shadows, we can't store that information into a file. The solution is to use a more extreme gamma curve, which will compress a much wider range of values down into the same 0 to 100 range. So every gamma curve has a maximum dynamic range associated with it, and the dynamic range of the final image will be constrained by the weakest link in the chain. So here I'm shooting with a standard gamma, and you can see that the dynamic range is pretty awful. My camera sensor is capable of much more, but it doesn't matter because the camera can't store that extra information into the file as long as it's using this particular gamma curve. But if I go ahead and switch to a log gamma curve, you can see that the dynamic range improves dramatically. In this case, I'm using S log 3, which has a greater maximum dynamic range than my sensor is capable of. So in this case, my dynamic range is only constrained by my sensor's capabilities. This is actually the main reason why log formats exist, to capture a greater dynamic range than would otherwise be possible. Now, you do need to correct that log footage into a more pleasing form, but I've already discussed that process in detail in a previous video. But the rabbit hole doesn't even stop there. Did you know that your ISO can impact your camera's dynamic range as well? If you raise your ISO, then the whole image will get brighter, including the noise floor. If raising the ISO pushes some of the highlights outside the dynamic range of the gamma curve, then they will be clipped prematurely, and you'll have effectively lost dynamic range. As you keep raising the ISO, the noise floor keeps getting higher, but the clipping point of the highlights doesn't change. So for this reason, you'll always get best results if you shoot at your camera's native ISO, which is usually but not always the lowest ISO. However, this only applies to non-RAW images. In RAW formats, the dynamic range actually doesn't change as you change ISOs. Raw images aren't constrained to the normal 0 to 100 scale, so even if raising the ISO would push some of the highlights above 100%, the raw container will still be able to retain that information. When you change the ISO on a raw image, what you're actually doing is shifting the dynamic range relative to middle gray. Let's say at a given ISO, our camera is able to capture 7 stops over and 7 stops under the middle gray point. If we increase the ISO by one stop, the noise floor moves one stop up relative to middle gray, and we lose a stop in the shadows. But we also gain a stop in the highlights, so our dynamic range hasn't changed, just shifted. Shooting at high ISOs on raw cameras will still result in noisy images, since the noise floor is very close to the middle gray point. However, doing so also allows the camera to see further into the highlights. So when shooting in RAW, you don't really need to worry about your camera's native ISO, and instead you can set the ISO based on how you want to prioritize different parts of the image. But again, this only applies to RAW formats. Any non-RAW formats, including LOG, still look their best when at the camera's native ISO. So with all this in mind, how can you get the most dynamic range possible out of your camera? Well, if your camera has a log or raw format available, you'll probably see some benefit by switching to it. But if your camera doesn't offer a log format, then unfortunately there isn't much you can do besides buy a new camera. But anyways, I hope you'll enjoy this video. My name is Cayman Crocker, signing off.